Go. Hi, I'm uh, Kevin with Local Supporting Locals, and uh, we're here uh, to do another segment for the Heartbeat of the Okanagan, and we're at the uh, beautiful Summer Hill Winery for the 7th Annual Organic Festival. Uh, the festival has been growing over the years. We've got some great acts, great vendors. Uh, the focus of this year's event is to talk about the, uh, the Arctic apple, the genetically modified apple. So we're going to go inside and uh, we're going to... Yeah. Comes mud and logging debris. Oh, Canada. Oh, Canada. Who stands watch from sea to sea? Who for a lost democracy? And who for the true north strong and free? If not you, then let it be me. So, um, that's how bad these corporations are. I know, I know. They are really bad. Um, you know, get you she's uh, part of one of the entertainers here for the uh, organic festival here. And what uh, really got me excited was uh, listening to her song, uh, singing about Monsanto. So, what brought you to write about Monsanto, for, for example? I was on Twitter, actually, and uh, there was an Indiegogo film project where they wanted to make a film, kind of like The Constant Gardener, a bunch of youth, teenagers start to take on Monsanto and take them out. And uh, it would have been quite an exciting film, I think, uh, mostly geared to young people. And I thought, wow, that's great, because, you know, entertainment and education, let's get the young people on board. Those guys, you know, they can really carry their weight. The youth of today with the Occupy movement, um, they're starting to be aware of the planet they, they're going to inherit. So I wrote a song for them as a perk. So if you donated $2 to help the film project, uh, you get a MP3 download of my song. So obviously you must be a millionaire to not if you <laughs> want to donate you know, all this money back to what... No. No, I know. And that's the thing I find with... Uh, like uh, putting together uh, the local supporting local calendar, talking to the farmers, you know, like why do you do organic? Um, and if you look at most of them, it's just because it's the right thing to do, yeah. you know, and uh, hence the real living with real food here. And that's that's a beautiful thing about this organic yeah. festival. And I find it's it's in its seventh year now, and it's been growing. This is the first time I've been here, okay. and um, it was really interesting to drive here. I actually lived in Kelowna. My grandparents had a orchards here in Kelowna and in uh, Peachland and grandfather in Peachland and um, then further south Sweden. But, so when I was growing up I used to spend time at my grandmother's orchard and it was on Perry Road and I drove by it and it's just suburbs and I was shocked. I was, I mean, I was shocked. And that's something we really need to recognize is that we can't keep oh, okay. spreading our houses all over farmland. It's really important to save our farmland. 
and and it's important to think about backyard gardening. I mean, we have a history with Britain, and after the Second World War, the Brits fed their people through history gardens, and that was everyone planted food in their backyard. Well, they got the Curtis Stone actually does spin farming here in uh, Kelowna, and he actually teaches spin farming, so that this way, uh, it doesn't matter how big your, your, your the space is, but he's teaches you how to make money off of doing this as well and feeding yourself good uh, at, at the same token too. So what, what's the title for the song that uh, for Monsanto? Monsanto Blues. Monsanto Blues. So uh, we will be filming it after and you'll be able to, to listen to that song and you can by all means uh, Google, how do we find the... Uh, Priscilla Judd dossier. Priscilla Judd dot CA and by all means pick up one of her CDs and uh, Thank you so much, Priscilla. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dieter. Thanks, <laughs> Dieter. Um, I'd like to uh, invite you to come and spend a little time here on the viewing platform, the observation platform of Summerhill Winery uh, with one of the most beautiful valleys uh, as a background. We're going to enter into a conversation uh, with some uh, learners. In I have no idea. I'm sorry I'm standing here. That's just sort of the nature of the beast, you know. I promise. Thank you. I will try not to talk so loud. Yeah, I will try not to talk so loud. I think I think if I could suggest to you that um, if your mission could be the same as mine, uh, I arrive uh, today with uh, some knowledge. I arrive today with some understanding uh, of what happens in this valley uh, with regards to this tiny perfect apple. The, uh, the forum that is uh, going to be talking to you today uh, has a phenomenal depth of knowledge and a huge understanding of what we are messing with uh, as we start uh, messing with our very food uh, and, and uh, genetically modifying uh, the organisms that we, uh, that we consume on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it's my hope and my mission that uh, today I'll leave here a little bit wiser, a little bit smarter, Some of these gentlemen and maybe have a little bit more microphone over to Wendy Wright. Wendy. Thank you, Phil. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for coming today. I hope you've been enjoying yourself at the, uh, the festival. So I'd like to introduce uh, the panelists to you, but before I do that, I just really want to hammer home the point of why um, we need to leave the apple alone and love the apple the way it is. Uh, I, as Phil mentioned, I am a, an advocate of organic everything and have been for almost 20 years. I have a wonderful family, two little children, and we just are blessed to be in this valley with the abundance of agriculture that we have. And uh, a genetically modified apple doesn't have a place here. It doesn't have a place on my table with my family, and it doesn't have a place in our, in our market. Um, it's going to besmirch everything good that is going on in this valley. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists today. So to the right, I have Jim Wood. And Jim Wood is a retired school teacher. And now he is a diversified, certified organic farmer who grows fruit, berries, and vegetables for wholesale and retail sales at Old Meadows Organic Farm on Gordon Drive. And I can attest to the glory of uh, Jim and Lorena's abundance. I've canned their organic uh, cucumbers with my husband two years in a row. We have their tomatoes, we have their peaches, and they are doing a really fabulous thing there. So thank you, Jim Wood. And to my immediate right, I have Dag Falk. Thank you for coming, Dag. Dag is the organic program manager with Nature's Path Foods. And Dag draws on his 14-year experience as an organic farm and process inspector and his earlier studies in agronomy in Norway. And Dag has some, some strong beliefs, and I agree, that organic and non-GMO agriculture is a solution. 
that can bring about a healthy environment, clean, healthy, and abundant food, and great natural taste. So thank you, Dick. <laughs> Phil Johnson, our beloved news AM 1150 guru. <laughs> And to the left of Phil, I have Fred Dannenhauer. And Fred is the president of the Similkameen Okanagan Organic Tree Fruit Association, and he's also a grower himself. Thank you very much for joining us, Fred. And just for the, the Fred tipping point, to the right of, or to the left of Fred, I have another Fred, Fred Steele. And Fred Steele is the former vice president of the BC Tree Fruit Growers Association. So thank you very much for joining us today, and I will turn the presentation to you. Thank you. If I uh, could uh, be permitted, you said a word a moment ago, Wendy, that, uh, that has sort of slipped from our lexicon. Canning. How many people sitting here can? <laughs> Better, not quite 50%, but you know what? I can remember as a kid watching my father and my grandfather and my mother in the kitchen canning hundreds and hundreds of sealer jars because that was the only way uh, that uh, we could preserve fruit and food uh, living in the far Black north. Species fruit that are snipped out and inserted into another species and it's done in a laboratory and the reason it's done is because we want some traits that is in another species and we want that trait in the species that we're working on. And that's the basis of, of this uh, technology. And like I said, it happens in a, in a laboratory. It does not happen in the field. It is not a typical form of breeding. It's not a part of natural breeding. It's not something that's been done for millennia. It's the first uh, crop that came out in North America was in 1996. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do today is, because I want to make it visual, I want to explain it, and it's a little bit complicated, so I'm going to do some props, I'm going to have some volunteers coming up, and we're going to use some, uh, some DNA strands, and we're going to splice it, and we're going to be like scientists here. So I, I'm going to need a couple of volunteers to start with. So anyone who wants to volunteer, I'm going to make, uh, have you be uh, corn. I, I, I would suggest the Raging Grannies right here. The Raging Grannies? Yes, sure, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> so if you can st stand over here facing the audience, or right there is good. Did you say a thorn? Corn. Corn. Oh, corn. 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 And what, what we want to do with you, <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a, a pest called the corn borer, the European corn borer, and it eats corn, and it eats the roots, and it eats all parts of the plant, and it destroys the plant. And farmers don't like plants to be destroyed, so they want to deal with this. So the scientists that are helping us, they said, let's help these poor farmers, and let's make this corn even better than God made it. And so we're not satisfied with you. I'm sorry to say we're not satisfied with you. We're going to improve you. Okay? Don't take this personal. You're, you're playing a role. Okay, so um, what, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a trait that we're looking for. So we're going to take a pesticide called Bt, and we're going to look all over nature and find an organism that has Bt in it. That's a, that's a pesticide that you can put on that corn borers die if they eat it. And we're going to put this pesticide inside these corn plants. So uh, I need another volunteer. This is going to be uh, a bacteria. Come on, Miss Bacteria. You get the really good role. So just ho hold up your bacteria. So you are a bacteria. This is a part of her DNA. And I just snipped this DNA out of her, you know, of, of, uh, of DNA. So this gene. So this is the gene for Bt toxin. This gene has Bt toxin in it. We want that gene into the DNA of the corn. So, watch me. So now we're going to insert, we're snipping this string of DNA in the, in the corn, and we are inserting a new strand, or a new, new DNA into the strand. 
And we have the expert uh, tying ability of the raging grannies here, which is very useful. So, you ha have a question. It was found in France, and, and uh, they, the, their, their uh, rats that they gave to guys and the others, what was that all about? The question was about a new study came, coming out of France and uh, about feeding studies for rats. And yes, that, this last week, France just released a study which was the first long-term feeding study for rats. And it was two years, which is the lifetime of a rat. The typical rat lives about two years. And so they, they ran the study for an entire two years as, as opposed to the studies that they did previous to that, which they the studies that they did to so-called so uh, prove the safety of this before they released it. And those studies were 90 days long. The, the ill effects that were found from the study, a uh, lot, lot of lesions, um, growths. Uh, actually, there's, there's some pictures over if you go to the table, uh, the third table in over there. You'll see pictures of the rats from the study. And uh, they had premature, premature death before the two years was over. Uh, it was a huge difference in the rats from the study group and the, and the control group. So yes, uh, this is a very significant study, So, and we should be concerned about the health of people if rats are faring so poorly. Okay, let's get back to our, our DNA standards. I don't know. I don't know. 
information. What are you doing here? It's, uh, well, do you, do you know who the Food Everybody. Policy Council is? Yep. Go ahead. The Central Okanagan Food Policy Council. Nope. The, uh, what we work on is local food, local security issues. And one of our big projects that we actually just started working on this year is the Central Okanagan Fruit Tree Project. And what that basically is, is a cleaning project. And so we're anybody that has fruit trees in their backyards, maybe they can't pick the trees anymore, or they just have too many, too many fruit that they can deal with, uh, they, they basically offer that fruit to our cleaning project. And then we have a whole group of volunteers that have come out this year to go pick that fruit. And the really neat thing is, is that the, the homeowner gets to keep a certain amount of the fruit for themselves if they, if they still want some. The volunteers get a certain amount of the food. And then what we've been doing is giving the rest of the fruit to places like the food bank and different groups like you can see right here, being 11 different organizations. So this uh, this uh, stay actually on uh, September the 7th, we've actually picked about 2,600 pounds of fruit. Since then we've done quite a bit more, so it's probably more about 3,000 pounds of fruit. And the, the whole idea is just to take advantage of, of all the excess that's out there and make sure that it gets the people that really need the fruit. So it's a really neat project. So we're here with uh, Peter Kerr. Uh, actually, it's great to actually find you in person. We've been on uh, Facebook and emailing together uh, for probably about a year or two now. And uh, this is uh, something that most people don't even uh, know even what the acronym means. And I know that for a fact because I checked with the Penticton City Council and uh, most of them don't have any idea that CETA is actually the Canadian-European Trade Agreement which will remove local government and their powers, but Peter's probably a little bit more up to date. Well, I may be a little more up to date about CETA, but it, it, yeah, it, and not only is CETA, but there's now the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership which is happening as well, which will include some of the Asian countries as well as uh, Mexico and Canada, which has just recently been invited and is quite willing to hop in, and that is probably just as bad as CETA, but CETA is the one we're concentrating on now because it's close to being passed by the government, by the federal government, and we were trying to stop it and have been for some time. So um, there are all the reasons in why it is bad, but mainly the main thing is it's undermining Canadian sovereignty. Can Canadians are not going to have the decision. So that's on that one, and then I don't know if you want me to talk about this uh, report card put up by the BC Health Coalition. It's uh, it's it's a petition asking the Premier Clark of uh, the BC uh, Premier to uh, uh, to follow the recommendations of the ombudsman, ombudsperson, who is recommending that there be some improvements in how seniors are cared for in BC, and we're sending these uh, cards back to the BC Health Coalition for them to uh, give to Premier Clark. So there's a report card here, and they're getting C, D, and D on their on how and on how whether seniors are even having input into some of the conditions which they have to live under. So those are they actually don't have an F on here for failure. Yeah, they should. <laughs> yeah, like uh, like Cita Cita is the one that, uh, as Pete, Peter was saying here, is one of the scariest ones because it is almost being passed here. But it removes the, the powers that local government have, um, including our resources. So we won't even have a say on what happens with our water. And that will all be dictated through the European Union, which people need to get properly informed on this. But again, most people don't even know what you know. They don't know what seat it is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Peter. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. So we're here with uh, Mark Haley. He's uh, 
part of the uh, Kelowna Peace Group. Um, are you the organizer, the starter, or is this just a, a member? Just a member, just a member of the group. Yeah. It's been in existence since about the 1980s. We started out with uh, concern about nuclear proliferation and nuclear arms. And here we are, 2000 and whatever it is, nuclear arms again. Nuclear proliferation and the hypocrisy of nuclear uh, uh, treaties that allow some countries to have nuclear weapons and prohibit other people from having nuclear weapons it's still a very uh, contentious topic. Well, yeah, well, that's it. I mean, uh, what is it, 10,000 villages? I remember talking with her in uh, Penticton, and uh, there were these little flowers that they were selling, and it was actually uh, made from kids that are fourth generation now, that are still feeling the side effects from Agent Orange. Like it's yeah, yeah. Yes, you know. It's so, it's so funny that they said you're using war for peace. Yeah, yeah well, every, every war has been promoted as a, uh, as a way to bring democracy, to bring freedom, and to bring peace. I mean, the to slogan... To bring McDonald's, to bring, bring The slogan, the war to end all wars, is a beautiful example. How do you get people to fight in wars? World War I, of course, was the most horrendous uh, destruction that mankind had seen up until that time. The way they sold it to the people who didn't want to participate in war was, well, this will end all wars. And of course it didn't. It led directly to World War II. And since then, you know, wars have pretty much been a common thing. And we're, we're supposed to accept war as a normal part of the uh, it's, it's necessary. We've always had it. We always will have it. So this has become a sort of normalized uh, tanks in the streets as we had in the, the 100th anniversary of the BC Dra Dragoons. Uh, the snowbirds, jets flying over. It's all part of the program to make us accept uh, military conflict and military uh, uh, action as a, as a normal part of life. There's no way to get around it. Colonel Peace Group says no, that's not true. There is, uh, there is a potential for peace and global peace. And it's, uh, well, it's a part of the uh, promotion of it too, like uh, almost is uh, when they talk about overpopulation. So we need war so that we don't get overpopulated, which is again false. Um, and, and that's one of the things that's being really promoted right now and almost justifies what they're trying to do. Uh, and, What's your opinion on well, overpopulation? To, to say that uh, we want to reduce the population of the world by war, that's a pretty uh, horrendous uh, statement. I mean, uh, I can hardly, I can hardly think of a, of a more cynical and horrendous you know, outlook on, on, on humanity. But I mean. Uh, the population, I don't feel, is, is really the problem. It's the distribution of wealth yeah. that is really the problem. If you have a 1% uh, uh, group that's controlling you know, 40% of the wealth, obviously that's, uh, that's going to exacerbate all the, the social problems and the health problems and, and all these type of things. So it's not that there's too many people, it's that too few people have too much. Yes. And uh, it's the old 99% and 1% thing. Well, did Would anybody you? talking over pop is that the same that we're going to talk away? We should start with them and eat. Volunteer yourself up right there. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a population, uh, there is a carrying capacity of the Earth. I mean, there's a limit to the Earth's uh, resources, and that's what what the uh, people that talk about the rights of Mother Earth, like Evo Morales and those people in Bolivia and so on, that's a really a radical idea that the Earth itself has a right to, to survive. And, and this is the, the, the Mother Earth, the Pachamama as they call it, that's giving us all, all uh, nutrients and it's giving us all the, the uh, things we need to survive. So it's, that Earth has a, has a right to to be protected, to, she does a pretty to good be job allowed of moderating. To, 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 uh, to, to keep on going. So, I mean, the, the war thing can't, can't coexist with, with ecology. Yeah. Stuff. I mean, people here are concerned about ecology, they're concerned about organic gardens and sustainability and everything. That's great, and, and I'm all for, you know, planting the garden in the backyard and everything, but the $20 billion uh, annual uh, defense budget and the, the rising defense spending 
I mean, I think that has to be part of the uh, part of the program as well. Well, that's it. I mean, uh, well, Jack, I mean, we're, we're, we're standing right beside the DC uh, NDP uh, poster over here. Um, the one thing I liked about Jack Layton before he passed uh, was. Uh, this whole uh, 13.5 billion dollars that our government's spending on uh, building prisons, and uh, as Jack pointed out, crime has gone down. But if you're starting with our current government, then we don't have enough money, for prison, you know, which, was, which was awesome. But it's the, when you see stuff like Harper, you know, saying, "Well, we we, we got to build our defense." They show how the F-35 is very inferior. It's a waste of money, but they still want to move. It lets you know right there that there's something wrong. Thank you so much, Mark. There is something wrong, but we can solve it. Yes, we can. Love is the answer. Right? And peace. Yes, we've Come lost that loving feeling. I think. No, I believe it's going. Yep. Okay. So we, we're here with Kate. That's uh, part of the uh, be safe GMO. Can you can you explain to us a little bit more about what you guys do? Yeah, we are based on a mummy. So I'm not going to restart this. It's a non-profit organization. We decided to call it Be Safe. Safe standing for a secure securing of food economy. Yeah. We decided to do this because our area was about to be. Well, well that, that, that's funny because uh, it's almost like the, the, the whole smart technology. Um, it, it's so smart, but they can't provide the science to prove that it's safe. And it's the same thing with Monsanto, with the GMO. It's supposed to be so good, but they can't provide the science. Or they pay for the, they sponsor the funding themselves to get the science done by their own scientists, which doesn't make sense. You know? So thank you, thank you so much, so much for doing uh, Wait, look, we're all doing our part to try to raise awareness and uh, be solution oriented here. And it's, at the end of the day, it's really going to start You know, it's, it's going to make a difference. So th thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we're here with uh, Wendy Wright. She's the organizer of the seventh annual uh, organic festival being held here at the Summer Hill Winery. Um, how did it go so far for this year? Oh, really good, really good. It's a beautiful day. I mean, we've had a blessing from Mother Nature with the sunshine and really good community spirits. You know, I know that out of all the 50 exhibitors that we have here today and the couple of hundred of <laughs> participants and our big volunteer team, that everybody's happy, everybody's enjoying the day. Um, we've had busier festivals in the past, but I think this one still has such a good vibe and it's been a fantastic day with the COABC apple pedal I thought went really well. And I think we're sharing such good information in a very uh, dynamic and approachable way that people can't help but have a good time. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. The theme for this year is about the apple. Mm -hmm. uh, apples everywhere here. Because <laughs> uh, the scary part is it's actually being developed right here in our Okanagan. Yes. Agricultural capital, and they're coming out with the genetically modified non browning apple. So, what's your feelings on the apple? I'm very upset by the apple, and that's why I'm directly involved in the campaign against uh, passing it, and I will do everything in my power to make sure it doesn't pass, ever. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a litany of reasons why we don't need a genetically modified apple. Uh, it's not safe for us, it's not safe for our environment, it's damaging to our reputation. It's already damaging our reputation. There are people in British Columbia who think this apple is already in the market and they're avoiding apples, and it's not. It's not in the market right now, but that goes to show you, right? Just that kind of negative connotation. Taking an, an iconic food, like an apple, that is simple enough and beautiful enough to be plucked off a tree and sink your teeth into, and they're, they're tarnishing it. They're turning it into something that is a, a petri dish scientific experiment. Nobody wants it. Nobody needs it. It's got to go. Fair enough. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Reach out and throw 
for the lane of them The supper pool And daddy smells of nicotine Fills our tank with gasoline And we roll our motorcycles down the street Oh, the wind on my face is so sweet It's unusual to meet someone like you I say it's uh, this song is about Okanagan Lake. I grew up on this lake. I had my first kiss on this lake. And other things. Fireflies They arch your back against the mast of the steeple and Picking glasses off you like birds from at the sun you know, we're to So we're, we're here with Gabe Sipes um, He's one of the organizers and um, part of the ownership of the uh, permaculture and biodynamics here for Summer Hill Winery and big part of uh, what the organic festival here is all about. Um, so it's been seven years now you guys have been hosting this event here. Yeah. And seven years of the organic festival, seven years of the, of the culinary garden, seven years, seven year cycle. It's good to start a new one. So what is, what, what is it that you, you do here on Summer Hill Winery? Um, I do permaculture and I do biodynamics. So uh, I'm creating diversity and creating resilience in every every place I can. So that means in between the, the vine rows and uh, the edges and the unused spaces where we're gardening and, uh, yeah, and also wildcrafting as well. So um, this is one thing I was talking about um, with uh, some of the city councillors and, uh, and our RDOS here. I don't know who's in charge of this when it comes to our agriculture here in the Okanagan, but what would you say to the lack of biodiversity that's going on right now? Which is accountable why they have to spray because we're getting all these super bugs. What about conventional farming? Well, yeah, like, well, like, like the, the lack of biodiversity. The lack of biodiversity is very sad. It's boring. And it's uh, it's unfortunate. It's it's stupid. I don't know. Yeah, I know. Well, that's it. I mean, uh, I just I just wonder what your perspective was like to see the lack of it and if you maybe you know like a, a lot of people don't realize if with the biodiversity uh, those insects that are in there that one eats the other and right. there's, there's a whole world going on in there well you know ecosystems are resilient Divers diversity is re resilience because the more the more you have involved in the wheel of life the better it balances itself out the less you have to do you just have to let let nature uh, take care of itself for the most part when you're when you're really in tune with what's happening in the garden and in your orchards and in your fields um, you can balance it out just using using and just even just uh, being able to be aware, or recognize what grows there naturally, and, and leave it alone and let it do its thing. Well, that's why I think we've had a maybe one or two generations who are, who got caught up in the whole corporate food chain here and have forgotten the grassroots. And now I see the shift coming back again here. So if somebody wanted to get involved and wanted to know more, like me, I grew up in Montreal, concrete jungle, don't know a thing about farming. Could come one come to you and learn about this stuff? Or? Absolutely, yeah. If you feel like volunteering yeah, for gardening, you're welcome to come out anytime and we'll, we'll teach you everything we know. So did you have a website or anything for, for people that may want to learn more about what you're doing here? Well, right now it's, it's summerhill.bc.ca is, is the website for the winery, but uh, I haven't gotten on my own uh, trip yet. But there's a lot of people that want to work together to create a school here, a permaculture school and wild crafting and artisanal crafting. Yeah, I know there's a big there's a big wee thing happening here, like in the, the one big tree gathering there. I noticed that too. And how every walk of life is now coming together, so that we're not only on the same book, we're on the same page now. You know, and everybody plays a role in this, you know. So thank you so much. I, I appreciate it.
Okay, so we're here with uh, Thomas Miller, he's a sales associate for the uh, Summer Hill Winery, uh, organic winery that is. If you can tell us a little bit about the Summer Hill Winery. Right. Well, um, Stephen Sykes, he started Summer Hill Pyramid Winery. Uh, it was really, uh, you need to hear me louder. You want to start again? Okay. Uh, Summer Hill Winery just had its 20th crush last year, and Stephen Sykes, who started Summer Hill, was really a visionary when he started uh, making wine to ladies because he wanted to be organic. He didn't like the idea of uh, his grapes being sprayed with chemicals. He had uh, four young sons at the time. The idea of having, uh, playing in the vineyards and exposed to those chemicals was just not on. So he was one of the very first in the valley to decide to go organic and he's actually encouraged a lot of growers who might not have gone in that direction to do so and also quite a few other wineries in the area now too uh, to go organic. We think of course that we're producing healthier wines, more flavorful wines, uh, and uh, that uh, we're serving the environmental cause also. We're certainly not allowing chemicals to leach into our lakes or the groundwater, uh, and we believe that our clientele certainly appreciates uh, the organic. So what about what the, because I'm just learning about this because I'm, I'm a wine lover myself here, but uh, with sulfur and sulfate being put into wine, like, well, all wines uh, have uh, sulfides, naturally. Uh, I mean, fruit juice, jams have sulfides. Uh, but it's a concern, even organic wines have, have sulfides. Uh, but um, a lot of wineries add more for preservatives. Uh, we can add um, some, but uh, we are well below what we're allowed to add as an organic winery. Sulfur uh, uh, used with grapes, well, sulfur is an organic compound. So. That's, that's allowed as well. So, but the, is there a difference between the quality or anything, like when it comes to an organic, or is everybody using the same stuff and it's, it's not really Well, a lot of wineries use far more uh, than okay. um, Non-organic wineries tend to use more sulfides. Um, organic wineries are allowed so much just to preserve the wine to get it on the shelf life. There are very few uh, wineries that say that their wine is no uh, and what they're really saying is they haven't added any sulfides. So, so what we got here is actually an organic uh, champagne? All of our wines are produced from grapes grown here in the Okanagan Valley by growers who chose it to go the organic way. And uh, this is uh, one of our sparkling wines. Sykes Fruit is a classic here in the valley. Uh, it's uh, produced uh, from primarily organic Riesling. And uh, it's won a gold medal nationally and or uh, internationally every year since it was first introduced in 1991. It's remarkable consistency for a uh, wine for many plants. So this is the wine that we will be sampling? This is the wine that you're going to sample. I'd be happy to share this one with you. I've uh, enjoyed it with family and friends many times. Thank you, Tennis. Pleasure.
Cause you're trembling and you feel you never share nothing to you Cause you don't know when you watch a phone Who you are, I quit it again I put no one else above And your eyes are my skin Set the bar pretty high. So thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure. Um, once again, my name is Ari, and I'm from Penticton. But uh, I am I am touring a lot, and I would love to connect with you. So if you can. Connect with me, my Facebook, etc. So, it's called Monsanto Blues, and I'm singing it uh, with words, but she's singing it with her voice. Yeah. So, I'm going to sing it with her voice. Yeah. And she's Injected in food seeds, so here's what I say. I don't want a little bit, all of it, some of it. When it comes to Monsanto, then I don't want none of it. I don't want no corn with trademarks on it. I don't want no licensing farmers from it. Sell me a little bit, all of it, some of it. When it's labeled Monsanto, then I don't want none of it. I don't Cause farmers are dying, BT crops are rotten. Now I've been told, but I really don't know how someone can stop what Monsanto now owns in the summer breeze by the birds and bees. GMO spreads like some kind of disease. No, I don't want a little bit, all of it, some of it. If I know it's Monsanto, then I don't want none of it. When I buy food, it's my food, but don't you know? I don't want a little bit, all of it, some of it. They've done it to death, and so I don't want none of it. I don't want no corporate DNA seed that survives all the pesticides sprayed all the bees. And I don't want no tofu from GMO soy, and I don't want canola 'cause it's a sad story, and I don't want. Sugar Yeah, we're here with uh, Ari Neufeld. He's actually he, uh, one of the uh, performers here at the Organic Festival. Uh, this is your second year, you were saying. Uh, so this is something that's close and dear to your heart? Or? Sure, well, it should be. <laughs> I think that the future is going to run more to towards personal lifestyle. Um, and that's for rich and poor people, you know? Like, we require community in this organic thing. It goes beyond food or um, substance necessarily. It has to do with community. It has to do with us personally connecting in, in a way with the earth and with each other. 
Yes. But, yeah, and that's yes. why I guess so. That's why I find a lot of these uh, festivals and gatherings that are taking place now. It's got uh, pieces of everything, so it's, it's a whole weed thing going on here. So, like uh, for example, uh, I was at a conference for one day three, bringing in the speakers. We talked about different issues, but then we lighten it up with grassroots uh, music like yourself and everything. And, and this is what's bringing everybody together here. You know? and, uh, I think you're phenomenal. Plus, he's from Penticton too. He's, he's got a place, place in my heart right there. You know, but uh, how can anybody find you, Ari? If they uh, want to get your music. Uh, my webpage, AriNewfeld.com. Arinewfeld.com. Thank you, Ari. I hope they've all had a great day. I've tried to connect with all of you, so thank you so much to every single one of you for supporting us. I'm looking around and I'm seeing some exhibitors here that have been with us since the beginning. Uh, you know, Vale Farms and Ken and Suzanne from Orchard Corners, and you guys are a big, huge part of this every year. So thank you so much to all the exhibitors that joined us today. A uh, big, massive thank you to the OOF volunteer team, the Organic Okanagan Festival volunteers. There's about 25 of us, all wearing some pretty funky shirts, and they've done everything from admissions to the green police to helping the cyclists, and awesome support. And again, we have a lot of the volunteers that come join us uh, every year, so that's fantastic. Thank you to the volunteers. And I'd like to personally thank all of my family and all of my friends very much for coming. And yeah, I hope everybody enjoyed the day and I hope that you take this information and the love of proper, organic, sustainable, green living. Take it forth, tell your friends, share it forth, and uh, we'll see you next year. And now I'm actually going to turn the sound over to the urban birds. And here they are. These are the urban birds. <laughs> Thank you, guys. He is the owner of uh, Summer Hill Winery. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about your background. I know I talked to T Tannis up there, your sales, uh, one of your sales associates. She told me the background with the vineyard, what you went to. But apparently you're originally from New York. I am. Born in Manhattan. And uh, always was a city boy. And always felt that I needed to be a farmer boy. <laughs> and after 40 years of uh, city life, I decided this is it. I'm getting out of here. Uh, found this glorious valley mainly through my friends who are uh, from Scotland that I met in New York. 
her brother had seen the valley and uh, said it was fruit growing, which I thought, wow, you can grow fruit in Canada? I, and I love Canada. <laughs> My grandmother was from Manitoba. So I always felt like I need to go back to Canada and I need to grow fruit, especially grapes. So I took off uh, almost immediately to the Okanagan Valley and uh, fell in love. Yeah, I know, I know how you feel. I'm from the concrete jungle of uh, Montreal. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I didn't know anything about farming. And once I came out here, yeah. I took in. They say it, it's uh, when translated, a place to stay forever. Yes. Okay. And uh, yeah, I, I tried. I went back east for a little bit, and I had to come back here. Yeah. So, what, what does the organic festival mean to you and Summer Hill Winery? Well, you know, I always, I always thought that my highest uh, contribution to the world would be to be the venue for the grand teachings and uh, to attract those who could speak wisely and uh, those who would be living wisely uh, to this little area because uh, you know it's almost like a, a diamond on an emerald planet. Uh, we have so much high energy here, zero pollution from industry uh, and a very light population. We're surrounded by wilderness for 200 miles in every direction. And organic, uh, let's put it this way, we in this valley rely on the lake for, for drinking water. And at this rate, I'm positive there's going to be a real problem with the drinking water. Uh, I can't believe that it, that's apple orchards, vineyards, uh, all these you know big heavy users of chemicals are allowed to just like, do it and let their effluent go into our drinking water. I mean that's so short-sighted. And then people like yourself and uh, the, like a lot of the organic farmers like from uh, took pictures of for the uh, local supporting local calendar like they say we got to pay extra to be certified and do the right thing and the conventional farmers that don't don't have to. It doesn't make sense our system's kind of backwards here. Well, we all have a lot to learn from each other. Eh? We're all each other's teachers. And uh, fortunately, those who are in the organics end of things are quite boisterous. And they know what they're saying and they will get their way eventually. We just have to be patient. Yes. You know, tap our foot here. <laughs> if you look at our website, the Somerville website, there's a seven minute video in the organic section showing an epidemic of cancer in children living next to vineyards in France. And to me, the whole industry, the wine industry, is not worth one child's life. Uh, I mean, you know, keep it up, you guys, <laughs> with your chemicals. Yes, no right? kidding. You see that video, you'll cry. Uh, children shaved bald, you know, because people are spraying grapes. The, the spray that you put on vineyards is toxic, and it goes into the wine. People think that wine is, uh, the doctors tell us, that it's very beneficial health-wise to drink one glass of wine with a meal. But if it's chemical wine, it's like jogging in a city street. Right? Yes. Well, apparently that's a big reason why you did it, because you knew your kids would be growing up here too, and you didn't want to participate with uh... Well, that's another subject, but yeah. yeah. As soon as I saw the heavy sprays, uh, and we were living in the, in the house here in the middle of the vineyard, I said, no, that's it, forget it, we're not spraying anything. My children's lives are much more important than any grapes. I'll rip the whole damn thing out of it. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. And I investigated organics, and that's the way we started. That was 1987, uh, so it's a long time ago, 25 years ago. So have you had a lot of vineyards follow your example now? or Not enough. Not enough. Uh, it's disappointing. Quite a few, uh, quite a few, and we help them to become organic. We offer to help them in any way, in every way. But uh, you know, you produce two or two and a half tons per acre versus four or six tons per acre, and uh, there's a lot of difference in money. So uh, they're into their chemicals, and money is the, is their god. That's all I can say. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. I could I couldn't think of a better way to close off the uh, organic festival here than with an with an interview oh, with you. Stephen. Thank you so much. All right, take care. You bet. Thank you. Goodbye from Summer Hill Winery. Thank you.